Well, this is, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be mean, cranky, and critical and be depressed. I don't think that's how it goes, is it? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Exactly. Sometimes we forget this. I want to begin my sermon with a story. A story. It's about my childhood. I want to invite you to see, feel, taste my memories because I think this story will help communicate what is happening in the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today. But I want to invite you in. It's going to be it's a longer story than normal. I've told it before, but just spotty references, so you might not know this story. Probably won't, but I'm going to go in depth. And I want you to listen closely. I want you to feel. Because if you can feel this, then you'll understand what's happening in the passage we're going to look at. I am the youngest of six, six siblings. When I was young, my family moved from Dayton, Ohio to Columbus, Ohio. Have you guys ever heard of Columbus, Ohio? It's a nice city. Anyhow, my grandparents still lived in Dayton when I was a young lad, and it was approximately an hour trip to go from Columbus to Dayton. When you are a kid, an hour's drive seems like an eternity, seemed like a long trip. Some weekends, my parents would drop me and my two sisters off at Grandma Kretz's house, Grammy's house. Usually they had to take my sister Lara to hospitals around Dayton and Cincinnati or sometimes my dad was on a business trip. They would drop us off on Thursday or Friday and pick us up on Sunday. And I just want to, I want to tell you, because the first service, after I said what I said, they don't believe this, but I love my grandma. Just, just a side note, I love my grandma. Okay, now with that being said, I did not like sleeping at her house at all. And here's reasons why. Her house was like a prison camp when we stayed there. Which meant if I ever talked back or complained, I would spend an hour and a half up in the bedroom quietly. My main complaint was her cooking. It was not like my mom's cooking. Grandma's chicken, it always tasted like rubber. Her soup had bones and smelly limp cabbage floating in it. And there were always these hard cubes of celery. I'd bite them and it felt like they'd break my teeth. But it just wasn't that good. I imagined slurping when I, when I had her soup. I imagined I was slurping down bat wings, beetle eyes, and a dash of castor oil. It just was not that good. It really wasn't. I'm not saying it. I love my grandma. I'm just telling you what this is true. People are saying you're exaggerating. I'm not. Her mashed potatoes were cold and chunky. Her gravy was oniony, and she always served soggy canned peas slopped down on a, as a side dish. The st I hate it when that sickly green juice would stain my potatoes. Oh, that made me mad. I can't even tell you. Eat everything on your plate, she would say, or no dessert. And that was okay with me because her dessert was usually week old angel food cake. She got a dot supermarket. It tasted like an old sponge. You know, you eat it. Is it going to break? You know. Then after dinner, we had to go outside to play with her adopted son. His, we called him Cousin Thomas. He was actually our uncle because he's adopted by our grandmother, but he was younger than us, so we called him Cousin. But he was awkward and quiet, would always have his hands in his pocket and look at us and say, so what are we going to do? What do you want to do? And he didn't have any baseballs or basketballs in her Yard was the size of a postage stamp, so with four people, we just played freeze tag. You can only play freeze tag for so long. And then we were allowed back inside. We were told to put on our pajamas and head to the living room where we crammed together, my sisters, I, and Thomas, on an old flower pattern couch where my grandma was sitting on her lazy boy chair and curlers, making us watch with her either the Lawrence Welk Show, Gunsmoke, or Hee Haw. How did you know that? How do you know that? Oh, you grew up in the same house. I really resonated with the Hee Haw song, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me, Deep Dark Depression, Excessive Misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. That's hard to hit that. 
gloom, despair, agony on me. That song was written especially for me at my grandma's house. When the shows were over, usually 9 o'clock, it was up to bed. I slept on a hardwood floor of Thomas's room. I was given a, sti a stiff, lacy pillow from the couch and a scratchy blanket to cover me. My back rested on the cold, hard floor, impossible to get comfortable. We, wouldn't, we would brush our teeth, say our prayers, and then lights out, quiet now, my grandma would hiss. I couldn't sleep, so I'd just stare at Thomas's plastic horse figurines that were on the shelves, and you couldn't take them off. The horses had such sad faces, like they were longing to be taken off the shelf and brought outside into the nice grass. But alas, my grandma made them stay in their spot, because that's where they belonged. I felt sorry for them, because I commiserated with their plight. I understood the plastic horses. But morning time was the worst. Usually the sun would come up around 7 o'clock, but we could not leave the room until 9 a.m. Birds would be chirping, cars zooming down the street, and streams of morning light would flood like spotlights, beckoning us to play. But I still had two more hours of lying quietly on the hardwood floor, staring at those plastic, sad horses. <clears throat> Finally, the old wind-up alarm clock buzzed 9 a.m. We could escape our jail cell and head to the kitchen table where we'd either be served runny, wet, scrambled egg or we could have a bowl of cereal. Here's what she had. Stale raisin bran, charcoal-flavored buckwheats. You guys remember buckwheat? It's an old cereal. It'd clean your teeth because it was so hard when you eat it, you know? Or rock-hard grape nuts, no sugar allowed. Pick your poison. And she would say, after you're done with cereal, drink up all the milk and don't waste a drop. I'd hold my nose and swallow it. Once we finished our breakfast, we'd go upstairs to put on our play clothes, and she kicked us out of the house until lunchtime. We would then explore the neighborhood. My grandma lived in this strange community called Greenmont Village. There were around 200 identical low-income houses built for people who worked in the Defense Department, right by Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The houses all looked like sugar cubes around this horseshoe. It was an economically planned village, they said, is composed of equal parcels of land. Every house had a flat roof and hospital white or canary yellow siding. So this was a creepy town. I mean, creepy. Glassy-eyed and hunched over old people were always walking on the sidewalk with canes or being pushed by a nurse in a white uniform. And they always seemed to be headed to the cemetery where they could read the names off of the stones. I loved it there. I fell out of place, so my sisters and I would run to the park where we'd swing, but there was nobody there. It seems like there was just tumbleweed going by while we were swinging out there. Hours lasted days, and minutes were hours at my grandma's house. I'd watch the hands and the clock turning, longing for Sunday morning when my parents would finally come. Saturday night, we'd be sent to bed at 9, like every other night. My parents usually would sleep in about midnight and fall right asleep on the pull-out couch that my grandmother had prepared, that same flowered couch we'd sit on the night before. But then, Sunday morning came. It was wonderful. My dad was always an early riser, and around 6.30 in the morning, I could hear him sipping coffee and rustling through the morning newspaper. That was back in the day when Sunday pa papers were massive. Remember Sunday papers? They're as big as my English textbook. They're huge. I could hear those large, crinkly pages turn, and I would sneak out of my room as quietly as possible, tiptoe past my grandma's room and bolt down the stairs and jump in the middle of my mom and dad on the pull-out bed and hide under the cover. My grandma had ears and eyes as sharp as a screech owl, and she was always on the prowl. One little creak of the hardwood floor set her off. Chris, get back in bed. She said it like that, in bed. <laughs> but on Sunday mornings, on Sunday mornings, she had to contend with my dad. She would head down the stairs in her pink nightgown and matching bed cap that would cover her rollers and point to my dad. Don, that boy needs to go back to bed. It's not yet 9 o'clock. 
My dad would snap back, nine o'clock? You make the kids sleep until nine o'clock? That's crazy, ma. Let the kids get up and enjoy the day. It's like prison up there. He would then find the comic section of the newspaper, hand it to me and say, here, Chris, check out Blondie and Dagwood. They're hilarious. My grandmother wouldn't back down. Don, send him back to bed. No, ma, he's my son. He can stay with me. And while you're at it, Ma, could you get me some more coffee? And I'm sure Chris would like some orange juice. He'd look at me and give me a wink out of the corner of his eye while my mom would do the best she could not to stop laughing. <laughs> when my dad was around, I was free. I was free. I was able to breathe, to smile, and rest under his protection. My grandmother and her soul-killing rules were no match for my dad. She lost her hold on me. Goodbye hardwood floors, scratchy blankets, green pea juice, rubber chicken, runny eggs, stale raisin bran, and no more Lawrence Welk. My dad set me free. I could live again. And hopefully with that story, you can feel my release on Sunday morning. Do you see how one person, the right person, can make all the difference in the world? Because the one person who loves me most arrived, who had more authority over me and could override the rules of my stern and crusty grandma. I could finally be me. And that's what we're going to look at in Matthew 12. That's what it's all about. It's all about the person who loves us most and set us free. It's about the ultimate authority, the one who, who alone has control over all the rules that any man can impose on you. And it's all about the joy he offers being in his presence. The title is Love Over Law, Matthew 12, 1 through 14. If you could turn there. Matthew 12, 1 through 14. It begins, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields. On the Sabbath, his disciples were hungry. They were hungry. You could hear their stomachs growling. And began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, they probably had a voice just like my grandma, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or, haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you, that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue. And a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Here's the context. The context is the issue of the Sabbath. And how does a person honor the Sabbath. That's what the context is all about. Jesus was walking through the grain field with his disciples. His disciples at that time were hungry. Actually, they were poor. They invested everything in Jesus to follow him around. They slept wherever somebody would take them in. So they were a bit hungry. And they ate some of the, some of the grain. 
The Pharisees saw it, and they got ticked. They were mad. How dare you? Because in their mind, they just broke the Sabbath, which says, thou shalt not work. It's the seventh day you shouldn't work. The Sabbath comes from the creation story. First six day, Jesus made the world. Seventh day, he rested. Or God made the world. Jesus did. And he rested. So in the Jewish calendar, the day begins on Sunday. You work through until Friday at twilight. So Friday at twilight, the Saturday at twilight, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, where you're not to work. Originally, the purpose of the Sabbath was to be a day off for God's people, a blessing. Instead of working, you could be with your family to be refreshed and worship together in joy. One Jewish scholar says about the Shabbat, the Shabbat is given to us by God to bring the family together once a week in not just quality relationships, but spiritual oneness. The Shabbat, as well as all the other Jewish holidays, let me see, where do I go? Where is my next thing? Yeah, are critical to bringing the family together for worship, solidarity, closeness. But it is difficult for families to celebrate these when they are burdened by financial distress and work. So the point of the Sabbath is God has given it to his people to bless them, not to burden them. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, who like to control others just like my grandma liked to control me, made the, made the Sabbath a blessing into a burden. A heavy, heavy burden. It became like slavery. What they did is instead of just honoring the Sabbath, they made sure you honored it right. So they came up with 39 things you cannot do because if you did them, it would be a sign of work. And what these things were is they were not in the Old Testament. They wrote them down on their own, and it became a tradition or a custom. You can look at it like this. Let's say I have a little kid, and I don't want him to burn his hand on the burner. Instead of just saying, no, don't touch the flame on the burner, I tell him, oh, I'm going to protect him, so don't go in the kitchen. And if you go in the kitchen, you're in trouble. And then let's say I don't like him going in the kitchen, because if he goes in the kitchen, he might get to the burner. I'll say, don't go in the living room because the living room's next to the kitchen, which is next to the burner. So I keep putting these laws on to keep me safe. So the Pharisees had all of these laws to keep them safe. And some were actually utterly ridiculous. Listen to one thing. Some rabbis taught that on the Sabbath, a man could not carry something in his right hand or his left hand, or across his chest, or on his shoulder. But he could carry something with the back of his hand, like that. That was allowed. He could carry something on his elbow. Or on his foot, which is tough. He could put something in his foot, just as long as it wasn't in his hand, because that's a sign of effort and work. Another one was on the Sabbath, they weren't allowed to tie a knot. Except a woman could tie a knot in her girdle. So if a bucket of water had to be raised from a well, one could not tie a rope to the bucket, but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket and then to the rope and then lift it up. It's fantastic. See how silly? It's kind of like my, my grandma keeping me in bed until 9 in the morning. It's silly. It still drives me crazy. So when the disciples ate grain, the Pharisees saw this as a violation of work. Grabbing a stalk was considered reaping. Picking grains off and rubbing them in your hand is considered threshing and winnowing. Eating it out of the palm of your hand was considered preparing a meal. All of it was work, and it was ridiculous. They turned a good thing, which was actually legal in Deuteronomy for the poor to glean on a Sunday or a Sabbath, they turned it into a violation of the law. Very serious. Very serious. So they turned the gift into a burden, and they got mad at Jesus. Look at the end of verse 2. Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. They're going after Jesus. It's kind of like my grandma going after my dad. What are you letting that boy in there for? 
Well, what Jesus does is he doesn't, he doesn't get upset. He stands up for his disciples. And first of all, he goes to the Pharisees and he shows how what his disciples are doing is nothing new. It's not unique. He goes in the Old Testament. He said, you know, David, when his men were hungry, they went in and took the showbread from the temple. Do you know only priests were allowed to do that? But it was David, the anointed king, someone greater than the priest could do that. So Jesus said, see, it happened before. And then the priests themselves, did you know that when it's Sabbath and they do sacrifices on the Sabbath, they're working, but yet they're innocent because God gave them special blessing to work. So Jesus is saying, see, it's no different. It's no different. But then he turns on them and he goes to the point of the law. What is the point of the law? The point of the law is always to bring us to a person. The law was the shadow of the one who is coming. That's why if you look at um, the end of verse 7, verse 7 and 8, if you had known what these words meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's greater than the law. Jesus is greater. He's what matters. He's why we come. We actually don't come to church to look good. We really don't even come to church to wear a tie and make sure we are obedient. We come to church to meet a man. It's pretty amazing. Really, all the stuff we do, all this stuff we do, it's about a person who loves me. And then he goes even deeper and he says, and the law, you don't even understand the intent of the law. In verse 7 he says the intent of the law is to show mercy, it's to be a blessing. It's to show love and not legalism. That sacrifice means, in a sense, God doesn't care. He's, he's, he's quoting an Old Testament verse he doesn't care how many times you offer up animals if your heart's in the wrong place. What he wants is a broken and contrite heart. He wants mercy. So you could say the law was given out of love from God to be a blessing. The Pharisees turned God's love into a system of dutiful obligation. And over time, the laws became more important than people. And that's why the second story comes up. It's a terrible story. A man has a withered hand. It's withered. He can't use it. And the Pharisees set him up. They put him in front of the congregation. And it's interesting how it says, look at verse 9. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. It's their church. And they do it their way. And they brought up a guy with a shriveled hand. And it says in other accounts of the Gospels that when they did that, Jesus was hot, angry, mad, because they're using a person's, a person's plight, his suffering, as an example for not doing something on the Sabbath. So Jesus doesn't take their bait, and he just says to them in verse 11, have you ever had your little teeny fuzzy little sheep ever fall in a hole on the Sabbath? Would you lift him out? Of course you would, or else you're cold and cruel. My wife and I took our poor little dog two weeks ago to the vet. Poor dog, he's getting old. He was wandering around. We have to take care of him, you know? Jesus said, did you know a person is much more important than a little teeny animal? Don't you have mercy? So what he did is he healed the guy's hand right there. It went from a shriveled hand into... A full working hand. Could you imagine the joy on that guy? That's joy! Yes, in his presence is joy. It's sort of like being next to your dad and he lets you read Blondie and Dagwood from the comic. And not sitting and looking at those sad horses on a hardwood floor. Jesus is amazing. You know, Jesus, truthfully, Jesus is much nicer than we've ever been towards people coming in the church. Remember, I always used to think, you know, before I was a Christian, I'm not sure people in the church would like me. But it's funny, after I become a Christian, they didn't want to tell me what to do. But before I was a Christian, Jesus loved me. 
So now that I'm a Christian, I really just want to do what he wants me to do. Because he's the one that loved me first. You could say it like this, how do you know if someone's a legalist? Obligations and commands are always more important than extending mercy and compassion. My grandma would rather have me sleep on a hardwood floor until nine because that was a rule rather than have me get up and enjoy the beauty of the day. Jesus would rather have the man healed or you healed from sin than you being looking like a nice Christian. The law was always meant to be a blessing not a performance. It was meant to protect, provide for you. Not to perform. You could look at it like this. I want you to look at it like this. Hopefully you'll, this will help you process why legalism is so tempting to people. It's because they, they put the law before love. You should actually come to the law after love. Let me show you. So God is love. That's what scripture says. He's love. When it says God is love, that means in him, in his person, he's full of mercy and he's full of grace. He wants to give you more than you can ever imagine, hope for, or dream about. Mercy, he wants to say, my son died for you, you're forgiven. He's full of it, full of mercy and grace. And he knows we're made of dust and he does not treat us as our sins deserve. So God in and of himself is love. Pharisees, however, are proud of themselves. They want to be impressive. They want to impress others. And so what they do is they think by doing the law, they will impress God, and God will love them because they do the law. So you could look at it like this. Here's a legalist problem. They think you obey to earn his favor. They think his love is earned. So they think the way you earn his love is by doing the law, by being a good person on the Sabbath. Or by dressing the part, tithing all the time. And so what happens is in their mind, here's where they go wrong. If that's true, I earn God's love through my obedience, then that means God's love's conditional. So in a sense, they never can rest in his love because they're not sure they can ever meet his standards because you can't. He's holy. So if you're trying to meet his standards by working, you'll never do enough. That's why a lot of people, when they're religious, they get worn out and tired. So the Sabbath, which was meant to be a time of rest, turns into endless work. Jesus says in Matthew, it's a yoke. Who here, here's a question, who here growing up grew up in a home where Sunday was the worst day of the week? It was a miserable day because you were never allowed to do anything you wanted to do. So to be a good Christian, to have God like you, you needed to work hard at not working. I'll give you an illustration. This is crazy, but it's true. The town I grew up in in Bay Village, Ohio, they have a park. It's called Cocoon Park. It's big. It's got four basketball courts, four giant baseball fields. It has one of those like um, kids... Playgrounds that are like castles made of wood. You've seen those massive ones where kids can run around. But the person who donated the park was named Cahoon, and she was a legalist, and she said, I will give money for a park as long as you don't play on it on Sunday. So in my town, police officers will stop kids from playing basketball, baseball, and go to the playground. And the pool's closed on Sunday, all because... She donated money, and Sunday's a day of rest. Misery is how I take it. My grandma was miserable on Sundays. You always had to hold that rosary and have that look like you're in pain. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou. Having a good time, Grandma? You got a harp. Hail Mary, full of grace. What a religion is so tiring. Oh, man. I just wrote this down. What made a good Baptist back in the day? No dancing, no rock and roll, no jeans on Sunday, no movie watching, no cutting the grass, no alcohol. Somebody told me that they couldn't even go to a restaurant on Sunday. And definitely no smiling in church. Definitely no smiling. 
No laughter. Darcy, no laughing. Darcy, hold it. And um, I shouldn't say it, but the music should sound like Lawrence Welk. Anyhow, let me keep going. <laughs> but here's the deal. Do you know what Scripture says? Here's what Scripture says. For God so loved the world, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God first loved us. He first loved us. And um, we weren't doing anything yet. We were enemies with him, and he loved us, and he died for us while we were weak and godless. Jesus was sent to rescue us on Sunday morning. It's all about the person who loves us most and sets us free. It's about he is the authority alone who has authority over rules and the joy that is in his life. And when you're captured by it, when you're captured by his love, you believe by faith and you become a child, a son and a daughter. And here's the deal about children. They are first loved. And since they are first loved, not based on anything they do, you know this in your own, with your own kids, your love is unconditional. So is God's. So is God's. So you don't have to perform to receive it. You just receive it. You believe it. And then what happens when he lives in you? Obedience becomes natural because you know you're loved, so you want to please the one who loves you. If you've ever been around a good father, you want to make him happy. You just do. You just do. The sad thing is we don't have, we're human beings, so we're not perfect fathers. But if you have a good father, you know how you want to please him. I even think if you had a bad father, you still in your heart want to please him. A lot of your anger probably comes because you don't think you can. And it's frustrating. There's something in there about you want to please your father. In the same way spiritually, when you are born again by faith, you want to do the law. Because you know it's good. It's a gift. And then the third thing I'd say is because it's unconditional, you can rest in him. You can rejoice. You've heard it said, most religion is spelled D-O. Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. I'd even take it a step further. Real Christianity is spelled J-E-S-U-S. -S. He's everything. He is why we come here. It's a person. It's about a person. So then why does verse 14 happen? Look at verse 14. It's the saddest part of this whole thing. But the Pharisees went out. So after Jesus just healed a guy, he just healed a guy who couldn't use his hand. A guy who couldn't pick up this cup can now grab it. Some of us take that for granted, but now a guy's been set free. It made the Pharisees so mad that they went out and they plotted how they might kill him. Why? Why do people hate Jesus? Why would anyone hate Jesus? I once heard a theologian say, if you aren't a Christian, it's because you hate Jesus. And most people would say, no, that's not true. It is. And here's the reason why. It's thinking through it. Why do people hate Jesus? Why did the Pharisees hate him? And I think you can come with some that are right off the bat because people are jealous of his popularity. People would come and listen to him from all over. They wanted his popularity. I'm sure the Pharisees did. Because he claims to be God. That makes people mad. They don't like the exclusionary aspect of believing Jesus alone. Like, you mean to tell me I can't believe what I want to believe? Mm, it's Jesus alone. They don't like that, which makes sense. I can see why that would make them mad. Some people don't like Jesus because he exposes their sinfulness. But I, I, I think there's something that goes deeper. And I think it evens in us. When all is said and done, when all is said and done, God the Father doesn't give a lick about all of our hard work or our accomplishments or our excellence or our brilliance or our boasting or our rules or our years of service trying, do you know how many years I served in the church? I really don't think God gives a lick. And that makes people mad. 
I know it made my grandma mad to say that that li- coming to Christ by faith is all you need. I remember she said, do you know how many years that I've been in a choir and I've taken communion as if she's earning favor? It makes somebody mad. God isn't impressed because he wants us to be in awe of one person, Jesus. He wants us to boast about his accomplishments. It's him we need to be impressed with. I want to show you a a scary verse. It's Isaiah 63 in the Old Testament. Isaiah 63. It's a verse about the return of the king when he comes back. The way I like to imagine this is the king is going to be wearing his white royal robes. He's going to be crowned with a golden crown and he's going to touch the earth to conquer it, to take it over. I mean, he's waiting for that day to come and conquer it. And Isaiah 63 is all about that day. And listen to what it says. Isaiah 63, verse 1 through 5. Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garments stained crimson? So the idea is he has a white robe on, a white royal robe, and up to about his thigh it's stained blood red. Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is I? Jesus said, I am. It's Jesus. This is Jesus. Who is this? It's Jesus. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the winepress? Well, because I've trodden the winepress alone. The winepress is the wrath on the nations of people who've rebelled against the Father. I've trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing for the day of vengeance was in my heart. And the year of my redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm worked salvation for me and my own wrath sustained me. What he keeps saying there is, I'm doing this alone. I'm the only one that is procuring salvation and nobody else. He has done it all and is going to do it all. And in my mind, how dare we take credit for anything we do when he's done it all? And I think that makes the Pharisee, the the legalist, mad because really they are doing things to earn credit, to be seen as better than others to compare, and to boast, and to want respect and accolades. And God says, my son, who is equal to me, took on the man, and not only became a man, but he became a slave, even dying a death on a cross, so that at the name of my son, at the name of my son, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. So I just want to end by saying we are here in this church because of him. We worship a singular person, and that person's name is Jesus. We need to stop being impressed with ourselves, stop working to earn favor, stop trying to prove something. Everything is because of him. Well, Jesus, uh, when Jesus finally shows up, I just would love to see him come in here. I just would. But when he finally shows up, all the opinions of men, all the silly political wranglings, all of the posturing and proving and arguing and competing will be done. We will look at Jesus and we will say, because we're his children, I am safe. I'm safe. Just like I felt safe in between my mom and dad reading Blondie and Dagwood. No one can touch me when I'm with Jesus. So we could end in this way. This is the day the Lord has made. So let us what? Rejoice. Because he's on our side. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's what this is all about. Not being an angry person doing the law, but somebody that has real joy because Jesus is mine.